Tonight on Dateline. It's been a long time since I've seen the stars. I would like to see that. They shared their lives and then the same fate. I can hold my hand right here and I can't see it. I can't see it. I can't see it there. Twin brothers who both went blind. How old was your daughter the last time you were able to, to see her? Oh boy, six, seven years old. And now she's 22. Now she's 22. After decades in darkness and extraordinary chance, another set of brothers will attempt what no one else has to bring these twins back to the light. We're looking at something that's never been done before. A landmark operation to restore their vision. Is it even possible? What if it doesn't work? I look at it the other way. What if it does work? Let me have the lens fragmenter. Two teams of brothers bound in a daring test of science and hope. I may wake up and see a whole new world. How far would they go? How much would they risk? Oh, boy! I think it scares you a little bit. Together, they lost their sight. Together, could they get it back? <laughs> Dateline is there for the moment of truth. What do we have right up here? Rob Stafford with Vision Quest, a Dateline special. From our studios in New York, here is Jane Pauley. Good evening. It's thinner than a piece of paper, smaller than the head of a pin, but its possibilities are beyond measure. This tiny chip may hold the power of sight. Tonight, we take you on an extraordinary journey of discovery. You'll get a look through the eyes of two blind men, twin brothers, who decades ago lost their vision. And you'll meet another pair of brothers determined to gain it back for them. Together, they would test the limits of science and of themselves. Here's Rob Stafford. I drove home one day and I gave my wife the keys and I said, I'll never drive again. That night, if some little kid would have walked out, I'd hit him. And I knew that it was coming. For more than 30 years, Melvin Keough had lived with the inevitable. Now it was upon him. He was going blind. Like you're turning a light switch down dimmer and dimmer and dimmer until there's no light. And that's the way it has gone. I can hold my hand right here and I can't see it. I can't see it. I can't see it there. What am I doing now? I don't know. As a young boy in Wisconsin, Melvin, who is now 60, was diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa, RP, an incurable disease which causes loss of sight. Melvin inherited the disease from his mother, who went blind at the age of 40. Looking at your mom, did you understand that someday that yeah. could be you? Yep, yeah, I knew it would be. Someday. It was going to be my turn. Back then, Melvin's vision was close to 20-20 with the help of thick glasses, and he was able to see well through his 20s, determined to make the most of his sight while he could. He worked in construction and met his future wife, all the while anticipating what was to come. Before I got married, I was sure, and I told my wife that I said, more than likely, I would be blind, and that didn't make any difference to her. Joanne Keo has been married to Melvin for 32 years. We knew it could happen. We didn't know if, if it would or when it would, but we knew it could. We, we always knew that. It didn't stand in the young couple's way. The Keos raised five kids, which kept them busy. But Joanne says that day her husband turned in his car keys, she knew what they'd been anticipating all these years was finally a reality. He gave me the keys and he says, here, I'll never drive again. He says, I'm afraid I'll hurt somebody. And then I knew that he really couldn't see. She knew Melvin, who was 38 at the time, was devastated by the loss of independence. I was the only driver then. I mean, we had this house full of little kids and I was the only one driving, so. Without her, how would you have gotten through all this? It would have been extremely hard. I owe her a lot. One thing that has been incredibly hard for Melvin is not watching his kids grow up. What have you missed in those 25 years? Oh, my goodness. Everything. <laughs> the most, I guess, not being able to see, you know, your kids. other things like that. A lot of things you take for granted. I can't do that. He never got the chance to see the face of his youngest child. His son Bobby is now 18. 
His oldest son, Scott, was a toddler the last time his dad could see. He couldn't really do the things that most fathers do, you know, take him play baseball and stuff, you know. God, I tried to get him to do it, but he was always afraid I'd beat him with the ball, so we never did that, so. But, I mean, otherwise, it was just like growing up with a normal father. I mean, you just had to accept the limitations that he had, you know, and just do what he could. The kids have been very good. I used to get a kick out of the kids when they were small. And if they'd have friends over or something, and they'd say, you have to move. Watch out, Dad's coming. You know, he's blind. He can't see. He'll step on you. Sometimes the children would move the furniture to try to trick their dad. Kids told us they played jokes on you a couple oh, of yeah. times. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What'd yeah. you think of that? Well, I got even. <laughs> Melvin's eyesight is now 20, 1600. Anything worse than 2200 is defined as legally blind. But he is thankful that so far, none of his kids show signs of RP. None had to suffer the way he has. You made a big point of saying to me, I can't use the utensils. And you kind of apologized before you, you got your food. Why would you do that? I've had little kids say, hey, Mama, how come he's eating with his fingers? You know, and they'll say, shh, that man's blind. Melvin, I want to see through your eyes for a second. Can you give me a sense of what you see? It would be like when you would first walk into a movie theater, you know, it's bright, and all of a sudden you walk in there and you can't see nothing for that instant. You know, for just a few minutes till your eyes adjust. Well, mine never adjust. It's just, it's never there. There's nothing. All I see is, is basically blackness. That's a dollar. And I'll get your change. There may be one person in the world who knows exactly what it's like to see through Melvin's eyes. He has a twin brother, Delvin, who is also blind and inherited retinitis pigmentosa from their mother. He describes going blind 20 years ago as a slow motion plunge into darkness. I have in a room with uh, a bunch of very small lights, just thousands of them, then each day I turn one of them switches off, just one little light at a time. And pretty soon you're down to where there's not very many lights on. In the years leading up to this point, Delvin married, had kids, and incredibly became a truck driver, taking the opportunity to see the country while he still could. But at 40, with his eyesight 2800, he too had to give up driving. And all the things he once took for granted were covered by a blanket of black fog. Can you see anything when you look across at me? No, nothing at all. Can you see what I'm doing right now? No. Uh -uh. Can you tell how many hands I'm holding up? No. What do you miss the most? Uh, believe it or not, the green grass. <laughs> to see that. I know it's there, and it's, to me it looks black. But I know it's green, and just, just a simple thing like that. How old was your daughter the last time you were able to, to see her? Oh boy. <laughs> I'd say she was six, seven years old when I could really see her. And now she's 22. Now she's 22, yeah. And keep in mind, the world the Keos remember is frozen in time, in the early 80s. The world has changed a lot since the last time you saw it. Oh, yeah. Do you know what a VCR looks like? No. A computer? No. No, I have no idea what they look like. When you say a computer mouse, all I can think of is a damn mouse running across the floor or something, you know. That's a mouse. <laughs> Another thing they haven't seen clearly in more than two decades, each other. Now quite a few pounds heavier, with hair gone gray, these twins, once nearly impossible to tell apart, have no idea what the other one looks like. Still, that doesn't keep them from guessing. Who's the better looking one of the two of you? Well, it'd have to be me. <laughs> <laughs> That ain't a fair question. <laughs> Who's a better looking one? Well, of course I am. <laughs> That's not what Melvin said, I'll tell you that. Where the hell's the goal? The brothers haven't lost their sense of humor, but they had lost almost all hope of seeing each other again. The actual pixels were still functioning. Little did they know, two other brothers, total strangers, one a doctor, were about to ask them to take a chance that could change everything for these twins from Wisconsin. This is a really a golden opportunity for myself and my brother. When we return, a second pair of brothers with an extraordinary vision of their own to help the blind see. Do people think you were crazy? When Vision Quest continues. 
Pretty good. Vision Quest. Tonight's Dateline special continues. The Keogh brothers seem destined to spend the rest of their lives in darkness, unable to see friends and family isolated from the world around them. I think everyone, in a way, should be blindfolded for a day and do what they could do. You would look at things so much differently. You'd be surprised at things you're even missing. But this gives me the control that we're looking for. What the twins didn't know was that a few hundred miles away, outside Chicago, another set of brothers was working on an extraordinary experiment that, if successful, might change everything for the Kievs. We're looking at something that's never been done before. No, some of them have more bluish sheen. Dr. Alan Chow is a pediatric ophthalmologist who spent the last 18 years caring for children with incurable eye diseases, like retinitis pigmentosa, the same disease that blinded the Keos and more than a million other people around the world. I had quite a number of patients with these kind of conditions. And the frustrating thing over the years was an inability to do anything for them from year to year, month to month. He was incredibly frustrated and anguished by one patient in particular, an 11-year-old boy who had come to see him in 1987. Dr. Chow diagnosed the boy with a form of RP. He could offer no cure, not even a treatment. His young patient was going blind. Just seeing him month after month and not being able to do something about it was what caused me to start thinking about this and then eventually uh, discussing with Vince over Thanksgiving dinner. I can monitor. Vince is Dr. Chow's older brother. It was Thanksgiving 1988 when the doctor first brought up the idea of inventing a treatment for RP, a silicon chip that electrically stimulates the eye. We basically went over the design. Vince says, well, this will work, but this will not work. Dr. Chow's brother is not an MD, but he is an electrical engineer. Bring down the infusion. And the treatment Dr. Chow envisioned would combine the latest in medical technology and an incredible feat of engineering. His hope was to create a microchip the size of a pinhead and thinner than a sheet of paper, which would be implanted in the human eye. A person with retinitis pigmentosa has lost many of the light-sensing cells that line the back of the eye and transmit the signal to the brain that enables sight. Chow's chip, called an artificial silicon retina, would stimulate the remaining light-sensing cells. And if all went as planned, sight in people blinded by RP would be at least partially restored. It was certainly um, an interesting discussion, but I remember I had two or three sheets of uh, why it would not work. <laughs> Vince wasn't sure his brother's idea was plausible, but he was intrigued by the possibility. By now you've probably figured out these brothers aren't your average sibling rivals. The fights they had as kids were often over who would win the science fear. They had half a dozen prizes between them. You're saying that you can actually round this with etching? But now these fierce competitors would have to work as a team if they had any chance of helping Dr. Chow's patients. Clearly alone, there's no way you could do this. Neither of us could have done this. I would not have been... See, when I wanted to quit, he pulled me along. When he wanted to quit, I pulled him along. And uh, so it was, maybe it was just that I didn't want to be the person that failed. I want him to be the person that failed. <laughs> With their own money, they won't say how much, the brothers started a company called Optobionics. And they went to work in Dr. Chow's suburban home. Packed with everything from huge model airplanes and boats to fossils, the house looks like a boy genius's playground. In the basement, you'll find pinball machines, a state-of-the-art laboratory, and the two sibling scientists debating a subject few of us understand. If you don't know us and you come into the heat of a debate that we might have, it's like we're about to strangle each other. But really, five seconds later after we reach a conclusion, someone would ask, man, that was a heated argument. What argument, you know? <laughs> heated arguments over an idea that sounds more like science fiction than science. What Dr. Chow envisioned was a bionic eye of sorts. It would be up to his brother Vincent, the electrical engineer, to design it. Did people think you were crazy? No, actually not. Actually not. The reaction was that, boy, if you could make this work, that would be quite something. But in the conservative world of medicine, it was hard to find people willing to work with him. Back in the late 80s, the idea of putting a chip in someone's eye wasn't just revolutionary, it was unheard of. 
when we first went to people to try to fabricate these chips, the first question would be, well, where are the wires? And we had to tell them there are no wires. Are there batteries? How does it work? I came to the conclusion quite early that if we can avoid batteries, wires, or other complicated power source, it would be something that can be easily placed into the eye of, of a patient that needs such a device. So as a result, the power source for this chip comes from just light. For two years, they worked round the clock on the first prototype. Finally, they were ready to implant the chip in laboratory animals. What's going through your mind as you get ready to implant this first chip? There was certainly a lot of excitement whether this can be done or not. We would oftentimes start at 8 o'clock in the morning and finish at 3 in the morning, but we're so excited that we'd go out to a restaurant and talk until the sun rose and we'd still be excited. Well, these are very they had no idea actually, whether the chip would even work, but the Chows knew to give it a chance, they would have to devise an entirely new surgical procedure to implant the chip without damaging the eye. The fact that we were successful surgically on Animos, that was a tremendous uh, step forward for, for, for us. It was only the first step. They spent the next 10 years testing and improving the chip while getting outside investors to contribute seven million dollars to the idea. But Dr. Chow realized that with animals incapable of explaining the chip's effects, there was only so much he could learn other than perfecting his surgery. He didn't know if it improved their eyesight. Was there a eureka moment for both of you when you said, we're ready, this is it? Not really. Not I think really. it was a, just a slow yeah. evolving process. Yeah, it was, uh, most of advancement in science is really not made of, of eureka moments. Thirteen years had passed since that Thanksgiving okay. dinner, so, and after all the hard right, work, gonna, the brothers knew the biggest the hurdles were still ahead. The next step, implanting the miracle chip in blind patients like the Kios. The question was, would it work? We now return to Vision Quest. By the summer of 2000, 13 years had passed since brothers Alan and Vincent Chow set out on a path towards curing blindness. The Keo twins had spent those same years in the dark, and they expected to live that way the rest of their lives. They had been without sight for 20 years, and there was no hope of recovering. I used to tell people, you know, they could have both my arms if I could just have one eye. The Keos had no idea the Chows were hard at work developing an artificial retina. And that year, the FDA approved the first phase of clinical testing on their device. See the pixelation. Finally, the opportunity to see if they could safely implant their chip into blind patients. Are there any guarantees? There are no guarantees. So far, Dr. Chow had only tested the chip on animals. It had never been implanted in a human eye. And as the doctor began his search for patients, he worried about giving them false hope. He wanted to make sure they knew this was only an experiment. It's a study where the outcome is uncertain. And it's very important to make sure the patient really understands this possibility. The doctor posted a website asking for volunteers. And once word was out, his office was inundated with calls and applications. They heard from people all over the world, from 42 countries, including Brazil, Cuba, and Italy. One woman wrote, I'm desperate. A wife inquired twice for her husband. Excuse me for being so insistent, she said, but there is nothing more important for me. I dream of good news. I imagine a future in which my husband can see. I'm totally blind. Then the Chows read another application, one from a blind man who lived in Wisconsin. It was Melvin Keogh who had heard about the trial from his doctor. Reviewing his application along with literally hundreds of others, we decided that his condition would be worthwhile to be investigated initially. So we brought him in. Melvin couldn't believe his luck. I'm quite excited about it. Six months had gone by since he sent his initial application, and he was beginning to wonder if he'd ever hear from Dr. Chow. The right eye. He went down to Illinois for his eye exam and passed all the tests to qualify for surgery. Okay. Two weeks later, he got the call he'd been waiting yes. for. Thank you. What was that moment like? Uh, pretty exciting. <laughs> really exciting. But Melvin had one request. After he was 
admitted to the study, he says, well, I do have a brother who's also very interested. It's all right. Melvin desperately wanted his twin to get the same treatment. So the doctors agreed to test Delvin, too. And out of nearly a 1,000 applicants, he also was chosen. The brothers were among only six patients picked for the study. It's a miracle that either one of us, I guess, has been chosen to go through it. And to be chosen to go through together, what are the odds of that? Together, they had lost their sight, and together they would have a chance to get it back. But there was one condition, and it was a big one. The doctors told the brothers that under no circumstances could they talk to one another about their experience. They could only speak with their doctor about how they were doing. For twin brothers who wanted to share in this experience, that was a lot to ask. That might have been one of the conditions where he might not have got in or I might not have got in. There was no way I was going to jeopardize that. I'm not kidding you. So they agreed to ignore the elephant in the room and find other things to talk about. Over the years, the two brothers who lived in different parts of Wisconsin had gone their separate ways. So they had a lot of catching up to do. And in a way, they became closer than they've ever been. We've talked about a lot of things and uh, what we'd like to do again. You know, maybe we might have a chance to do it again. So, yeah, it's, it's changed. We've, I think we've got to know pretty good. Have you and your brother talked about if this operation is successful for one of you, but not the other. We might have mentioned it a little bit, but if it works for him and not for me, I think that'd be wonderful. At least one of us got it. 50-50 is pretty good. If it has to turn out that way, Delvin would rather it be the other way around. After all, Melvin was the one who insisted he take part in the study. That's the way I'd like for it to be, if it would work for him and not me. Hey, I've been very fortunate. I've got to travel a lot and see a lot of the country. My brother hasn't. There were plenty of unknowns. After all, it was an experiment. And with that came risk, like the possibility of infection. Still, there were no second thoughts. What if it doesn't work? I have lost nothing. I have lost nothing. But I look at it the other way. What if it does work? After years of living with no hope of ever seeing again, the Keos were ready to take their chances. Their surgeries were scheduled for July of last year. Melvin was counting the days. I'm really looking forward to it. I can't really wait, in fact. Dreaming of seeing his family again. I want to see my kids. For his kids, it didn't matter either way. His daughter, Lori. Even if the surgery doesn't replace his sight, he's still our dad. I mean, it's not going to change anything. That's for sure. We still will love him just as much, sighted or unsighted. Delvin was counting his blessings. A week before the operation, an electrical fire destroyed Delvin's home and could easily have killed him. Now divorced, he was home alone. It was the middle of the night, and his blindness made escape almost impossible. But with the help of his guide dog, Bud, he made it out alive, more determined than ever to go forward with the surgery. What I have to do is concentrate on uh, going down and, uh, and uh, receiving this here operation. Uh, that's what I have to concentrate on. Try to think, make sure I got everything. With emotions running high, the two brothers packed their bags for the 200-mile trip to Illinois. They had spent close to half their lives in total darkness. Over the next few months, they would find out if all that would change. We now continue with Vision Quest, a Dateline special. After 20 years of blindness, the Keogh twins might finally experience the wonder of sight. They were about to embark on an opportunity of a lifetime, an experimental surgery that could restore some of their vision. It isn't until the night before the operation that the brothers start to get nervous. I wish it was all over. Getting real, just sitting around waiting is hard to do. Damn hard to do. They're holed up in a hotel, counting down the hours. We've been back and forth to each other's rooms, I don't know how many times today. <laughs> the brothers try to keep themselves busy, swapping stories about their childhood, <laughs> listening to books on tape, 
and wondering aloud what a hospital would be like without sight. You had to totally trust everybody. You know. Not that it scares you a little bit. To help pass the time, Dr. Chow and his staff invite the Keos out to dinner at a local restaurant. The doctor and his patients have become quite fond of each other. Delvin, I'm Delvin. No, no, come on, Delvin. <laughs> there, the doctor delivers a potential blow to Delvin. One of his blood tests has come back with unusual results. That might disqualify him from the FDA trial. He might not be able to get the implant. Is there a chance that it would be... You won't get it? I would be turned down because of this? Well, not that we can help it. Delvin has come too far to give up. Wouldn't that be something to get this far and oh, that be the end of it? I don't even want to think about that. After a sleepless night, oh. his prayers are answered. The following morning, the FDA gives the go-ahead to include Delvin in the study. This time, Delvin, the younger twin by a few seconds, will go first. His surgery will take place at Central DuPage Hospital in Wheaton, Illinois. So everything has been approved and you're all, all set to go. Sounds good to me. <laughs> Moments later, Delvin is overwhelmed. Oh, boy. I'm sorry. The surgery will take two hours. Delvin will be under anesthesia the entire time. In the operating room, the doctors are busy setting up. Can you take my glasses off, please? Before the microsurgery can even begin, Dr. Chow needs to prepare the tiny implant, the size of a pinhead for insertion into the eye. Let me have the lens fragmenter. His brother Vincent, the engineer, is standing by videotaping the procedure and watching to make sure everything's okay with his design. They know the difficulty lies in the dimensions. Like a tiny piece to a puzzle, the chip has to fit mm -hmm. perfectly mm -hmm. underneath Delvin's retina. As part of the experiment, only the right eye will be operated on so the doctors can compare the progress. Can you take the light and point in from the side? Dr. Chow and a team of three other surgeons first make three tiny incisions in the white part of Delvin's eye, none larger than the tip of a needle. Then they clean out the eye and fill it with saline solution. Next, a pinpoint opening is made in the retina, just large enough to accommodate the chip. Using a specially designed tool and air pressure, the surgeons gently try to work the implant into the right spot. Maneuvering something so small without injuring the eye is the most difficult part of the procedure. The tension was very thick. There was absolute silence mm -hmm. in an operating room where there were perhaps 20 people, 15 to 20 people. No one even breathed as we were putting the chip in. You successfully implanted the chip? Yes. Yes. And at that point, there was a eureka from everybody. <laughs> now you got to find out whether it works. That's right. Yes. Open. The doctors check in on Delvin the following morning. How are you doing today, Delvin? Real good. How are you feeling? Feel good. Okay. Delvin is relieved it's all over. His brother is still waiting. Melvin, how are you feeling? Are you uh, nervous? All set? <laughs> nervous. <laughs> His surgery isn't until later that afternoon. Let's have a door slide and open and close. And as Melvin stands by as his twin brother gets discharged from the hospital, his thoughts are on what awaits him. I'll be glad the day is over. I'll be glad the day is over. A few hours later, Did you know okay? Just a little nervous. across town at Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's Hospital in downtown Chicago, Melvin got his wish. Just a little bit, and that's in perfect position. The surgeons Done. successfully implant the chip okay. in Melvin's right eye. Great job, everybody. <laughs> he is on his way to recovery. Well, I feel real good. Real good. The chip is exactly where we put it. The doctors have inserted the two chips. The band-aid. Huh? They'll remove the bandages the following day. But it will take weeks of healing before Melvin and Delvin will know if the implant works. Weeks where the Keos can't say a word to each other about whether or not they can see. Quietly, they pray for that day. Do you remember what a Wisconsin sunset looks like? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You get some very pretty ones when it, the sun hits the sky and the clouds and stuff just right. I'd like to see that. You know, it's been a long time since I've seen the stars. I would like to see that. That would be, you know, that'd be the greatest. And next, the artificial retina that's been called a miracle chip. Now, can it possibly work miracles for the Kehoe brothers? Very tough moment for you. 
The conclusion to Vision Quest will continue after this brief message. And now the conclusion to Vision Quest. This is the worst part. It's the morning after doctors completed experimental surgery on Melvin and Delvin Keo, and time to remove the bandages around their eyes. These blind brothers haven't been able to see for decades. Ah, I feel mighty good. Feeling mighty good, huh? <laughs> mighty good. Melvin is relieved they're off, but here. notices no change, nothing. But remember, the doctors warned him it could be weeks, even months, before any sign of improvement. And there's no guarantee his eyesight will improve at all. And looks kind of sensitive. The two brothers are tested to make sure the implant is in place and that the eye is healing properly. Very happy with how that operation has turned out. From a strictly scientific point of view, the procedure could already be called a success. A success easier to obtain for Dr. Chow than for his blind patients. In fact, the doctor has already accomplished the primary goal of his FDA study, to test whether the human eye could even tolerate the chip. Any complications? No complications that we've noted so far. Rejection? None. Inflammation? None. So far, so good? Yes. Yes. The chip is safely in the eye, but will it actually restore sight? Look down. Over the next several months, the doctor will closely watch Melvin and Delvin for any signs of improvement or failure. As the twins head home, they're already dreaming of what they might see. Delvin has one person in mind. What would you want to see? See the doctor. I, I just uh, see him and... For Melvin, each morning brings hope of new discoveries. It's kind of thrilling to look day ahead, you know, what, what will it be tomorrow, what will I see tomorrow? But the first three weeks are full of unanswered questions and disappointment. I still, you know, don't get around as good as I'd like to. I can just barely see the side world, that's all. So far, Melvin hasn't seen much of anything. He was really noticing no change no difference. It's hard to come home. Meanwhile, Delvin is busy focusing on other things, like picking up the pieces after that devastating fire at his home. Yeah, you pick up and you go on, that's all you can do. Impatiently waiting for any sign of progress, a flicker of light, a shadow, some indication the surgery had worked. Someday uh, later on, I may wake up and I'm sure I'll see a whole new world. and that. And I might not be able to see anything either. This side over here. At the one month mark, the Keos are back at Dr. Chow's office for okay. testing. Their appointments are on the same days, even though neither brother knows how the other is doing. Melvin thinks he has experienced some slight changes in his vision. But I still see motion where I didn't see the motion before. He came in and he said, uh, Doc, in just the past several days, something is starting to happen. He tells the doctor that he believes he can see things he hasn't seen in 20 years. A car driving by, his own shadow on the sidewalk, but he isn't positive. I didn't know if I was imagining it or actually seeing it. While Melvin isn't sure if his eyes are deceiving him, Delvin is convinced his eyes are improving. He started noticing things that he was sure he did not see before. Things around his home, yeah. colors, like a red and white checkered tablecloth, and the view from his kitchen. I'd have to hold real still and focus by looking out the window. I could see the, the tree limbs. That must have been pretty surprising to you. <laughs> it was. It was. Felt good. We don't know until everything. Delvin is overcome with emotion about what else might be in store. I'm sure it's going to be uh, a lot of sight. And it's... It's a wonderful feeling. <laughs> S.D. Four months later, a. in December, sure enough, Delvin a. continues a. to make enormous strides. Delvin can now read eye charts, count fingers. Two, one. And amazingly, and Two most thumb. importantly, see faces again. Are you able to see your own face? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why, why are you laughing? Uh, I look old, Doc. You look old. <laughs> Without sight, Delvin has been ageless. Now, after all these years, he doesn't recognize the stranger in the bathroom mirror. What'd you see? I didn't like what I saw. I looked old. One face he is thrilled to see, just as he had hoped, his doctors. 
Over the course of the last six months, Delvin has developed a close relationship with Dr. Chow, and he is anxiously awaited this uh, moment. The first time I saw your face, and I don't know if I got to say it, but uh, first time I saw an angel. <laughs> You told Dr. Chow that he looked like an angel. What did you mean? For what uh, he's done for myself, my brother, and, and uh, several other people, to give him real hope and a real chance to be able to do some of the things that they haven't been able to do for a long time. Or uh, see. Delvin's vision in his right eye is now 2200. Okay. Correctable vision with glasses. Four times better than when he okay. first entered the study. Remember, he has no idea how Melvin is doing. These brothers have been under strict orders not to discuss the results of the surgery. But back at home, Delvin is seen more and more every day and he'd like nothing more than to share his miraculous results with his brother. After all, they've been through so much together already, watching their mother go blind and then suffering the same fate themselves. But what Delvin doesn't know is that his brother isn't seeing much of anything. Oh. After four months, Melvin is still struggling. It's gone. That, that letter totally left me. Still not in. He says his vision improved ever so slightly, but it comes and goes, which leaves him frustrated much of the time. Quite discouraging. The, the, uh, the pain you're having or the Well, no, the, the results I'm coming up with, it's, it's discouraging to me. I'm going to move and see if you can locate me. Just days after the surgery, long before the chip possibly could okay, have helped guys, their vision, right the brothers were allowed to show us just how little of their eyesight was left. I'm going to move. Count to 10 and then see if you can tell where I am. Point at it. What do you see? Oh. And what do you see? What am I doing? I got no idea. I can't see. You're making a pool of yourself? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any idea. Oh boy. It's now four months later. Yeah, Time Just for the brothers to learn me. if the other can see. We brought them back to a field. Count to five and then point to where I am. Okay. Right there. Right. I'm facing right at him. Melvin, Delvin, you can see me? Yes, sir. I can. Yeah. Melvin? I, I cannot. You can't see? No. You can't no, I cannot. Right? I cannot tell you at all. No. Now do you see him? No. He's about eight feet in front of you. Or six, six maybe eight. six feet. So quite a difference between the two of you. Yeah, apparently so. We didn't know that. No, we did not know that. And Melvin, how do you feel about that right now? Well, I guess a little disappointed, but <laughs> no, I don't. I'm really happy for him. He'll catch up, no doubt. All right. I'm sorry. You couldn't make me out nope. in that field at all? No. Nope. You couldn't see what I was doing no, with my no, arms? No. Not even a shadow? No. No. Melvin, who first wrote to the doctor and insisted his brother be part of the study, is now left behind. I think it uh, kind of shook me up a little. That, you know, it, a lot of thoughts. You know, thoughts I won't tell you about. Remember, given the choice, Delvin would rather his brother be the one to see. They waited all these years for this day to come. Now, it is bittersweet. You clearly were able to see me, and Melvin could not. Yeah. Very tough moment for you. Yeah. I think... Uh, in time, maybe he will have what I have. I, I hope and pray to God that happens. So far, it hasn't. 
And even though Melvin's sight has improved to 2400 in his right eye, he is still legally blind. And his vision isn't strong enough to look into his wife's eyes or see his children's faces. A reality, Melvin says, he was prepared for, but one that's been difficult for his loved ones, even though they said it didn't matter to them. I think my family, in a way, expected uh, more than what I really did. You know, they, they, I think they really truly expected a miracle. They're, the doctor put this in, this chip's going to be just wonderful, Every, I'm going to be able to see perfect. Oh, okay, I see it now. And while his brother Delvin's vision isn't perfect, his improvement is pretty miraculous. After all these years, he can see faces, including his daughters, something he hasn't been able to do since she was a little girl. When I was a kid, it was kind of fun trying to hide on him. You know, because when you're a kid, you don't understand those things, and <laughs> and uh, it'd be fun hiding on him. And now it's like, well, I can't do nothing in front of him. You don't want him to see, you know? <laughs> so I'm proud of him, though. I'm, I'm very proud of him. We're going straight ahead. Delvin prays it won't be long before his brother catches up with him. And maybe he will. The doctors say with time, both brothers' eyesight may continue to improve. Melvin is hopeful. But if he doesn't, he knows he can count on Delvin to lead the way. I'll make him show me where I'm going. <laughs> I'll be very happy. Why wouldn't you be? To have your brother be able to see better than you? That's better than yourself. Dr. Chow says Melvin's vision is slowly improving. Four more patients are scheduled to get the retinal implants this summer. Doctors stress this procedure is still in the experimental stages and is strictly limited to people who suffer from retinitis pigmentosa. The implants are not available to the general public, and in fact, it may be years before testing is complete. But the hope is that someday, artificial retinas may help restore some sight to millions of others. Defective retinas are the world's leading cause of blindness. You can find more information about retinal implants on our website at dateline.msnbc.com. That's all for this edition of Dateline Tuesday. We'll see you again for Dateline Friday, starting at a special time, 8, 7 central. Now stay tuned for your local news. I'm Jane Pauley. For all of us at NBC News, 